Peter McMillan, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer at NT Shelter. Today, we're happy to be bringing you another uh, podcast of Sharing the Couch, and our special guest today is Leanne Mitchell. I'll be introducing Leanne in just a moment, but to start with, I'd like to acknowledge that we're broadcasting today from the land of the Larrakee people in Darwin and pay my respects to their elders past and present and to all emerging Aboriginal leaders as well. For those First Nations people watching on from outside of the Northern Territory, a very warm welcome to you too. Leanne Mitchell is a purpose-driven leader with over 15 years experience in collaboration design and facilitation, systems thinking, social impact strategy and management consulting. She's an Australian government worker, writer and anthropologist who's convinced that we can all do better to make the world a fairer place. In government, the United Nations and the not-for-profit sector, Leanne has worked with people displaced through natural disaster and large-scale development projects and communities facing homelessness in cities. Working for Brimbank City Council and the City of Melbourne exposed Leanne to the limitations and the opportunities that local government encounters in responding to homelessness. She has used her skills in communications, in anthropology and management, having worked in government, the United Nations, non-government organisations and consultancies in six countries. In 2022, Leanne undertook a Churchill Fellowship investigating how councils can respond to rough sleeping while balancing responsibilities to the wider community. She visited the UK, US and Canada, interviewing some 90 people in government, organisations and services. Her report, Everybody's Business, identifies the specific role local government can play in ending Australia's homelessness crisis and provides practical guidelines and case studies to assist councils to take action. I'd like to read uh, one of Leanne's insights from a fellowship that really struck a chord with me, and perhaps we can explore it further in a conversation. And I quote, strategy is important and local government can lead efforts in getting a homelessness strategy off the ground. Councils that are brave enough to collaborate closely with community, to listen and even hand over some or all of their decision-making power are seeing great success. Leanne Mitchell, welcome to Sharing the Couch. Hi Pete, thanks for having me and um, I might just start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where I am here in uh, Melbourne, it's the Wurundjeri people and I pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging. Thank you so much for having me, it's great. Fantastic, to Fantastic Leanne, thanks for coming on the program. Look, this, uh, this report of yours, the guidelines, uh, everybody's business, what local government can do to end homelessness. Hot off the press. Um, really excited that you're on the program. I think we're probably one of the first uh, people you're talking to, to, to people who are watching or listening in on this podcast. So it's great we're able to get some of your time to, uh, to run through it. Really looking forward to hearing about the journey uh, and the amazing experience that must be uh, the Churchill Fellowship. So we'll come to that in just a minute. I guess I'd like to just start off by asking, you know, as I said in the intro, you've done some really interesting things over, over the years. You've worked, I see, in Thailand and in Sri Lanka, in Washington, with organisations like UNICEF and, and, um, and others. Uh, you've worked a long time, uh, 11 years with the City of Melbourne in various community services roles. Um, as I said before, in Washington with the World Watch Institute, I see, four years and two months there, um, and with the Red Cross. So you've done a lot of work. Um, I guess in 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 organisations that have big visions and important programs, can you tell us a bit about yourself and I guess and what what got you into that line of work? Thanks, Pete, and um, thanks for having a look through my uh, resume so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I've worked in lots of different places and been lucky to work in lots of different countries and. Um, I think the main thing for me, I'm trained in communication and journalism, and I think I was just always really curious about things. And I travelled around for a few years and picked up a few jobs here and there, and it was just a great opportunity to learn from lots of people and to, to see many different things. And what I saw along the way was that, you know, the world needed to be a better place in a lot of instances. And I got to work at one stage in, in Thailand with a whole lot of anthropologists. And I often thought if I'd known what anthropology was when I was in high school, I would have gone and studied it. But instead I studied journalism, which was a great uh, career choice, I think, as well. And it allowed me to do a, a whole lot of things. And I suppose about uh, 20 years ago, 
I started just really um, gravitating towards jobs that involved displacement and people's homes. So uh, I was working for um, the World Watch Institute in Washington, D.C., and there was a lot of work about social justice, about people living in cities and uh, you know, sort of all the, the real difficulties that people in, in many different places face. And then I got to uh, go and uh, work for uh, in places like, like Thailand and work with people who were, you know, also losing their homes for other reasons. For example, in uh, working on uh, when places became uh, world heritage sites and sort of looking at the impact on their homes. And then an opportunity came up to work for UNICEF on um, after the tsunami in 2004. And that's when I really started looking at uh, displacement. So it's been, you know, quite a trajectory. I've gone through to the, you know, the Red Cross and, and worked in many places. But I think when I turned up at the city of Melbourne and started working in the homelessness team, it was the point when I realised I'd really found my place and my people. And it was really just um, those stories of, uh, you know, situations that people would, would find themselves in often because of a whole lot of other things that had happened in their lives. And there was a real need to assist. And I thought that local government was a really great place to, to do that and a great place to make a difference. Although sometimes people don't really recognise it as, as being that. Yeah, I wanted to I said we'll be talking a lot about local government uh, today. And you've you said um, uh, in your report a, a lot about, I guess, the challenges that local government had as far as community expectations are concerned. Often members of the community expect local government to be at the forefront of addressing local issues, but don't have the necessarily have the expertise or the funding or the, um, I guess, the mandate to, to do a lot of those things. So, yeah, is, does that kind of ring true for you in terms of things like homelessness? Absolutely. Um, actually, when I was working in, in the, home, the homelessness team at the City of Melbourne, was I joined there in 2015 and uh, we were, you know, just a small team of mostly people with a social work background who were really there to, you know, work with people and work with the communities and to work with um, our partners to really make a difference for people who were who were sleeping rough in the city or experiencing other forms of homelessness. And it was, uh, you know, we had a homelessness strategy and we did a whole lot of, uh, you know, work to uh, proactively work with people. But what happened was in 20, the summer of uh, 2016, it was almost overnight, it seemed, but in, a, in the space of just a few weeks, the numbers of people sleeping rough in on the streets in, in a city, Melbourne, increased dramatically and really visibly. And all of a sudden, homelessness became, um, you know, not only a social problem and a social issue, but a political issue as well. And our small team wasn't really ready for that, I suppose. We weren't ready for the many different uh, roles that the council needed to play when something like that happened. Because what happened was we started seeing homelessness on the streets and then we realised that one council is actually a lot of different uh, organisations in one. So a council might actually be, you know, you have your, your team of, of social workers working with people who are homeless, but you also have people in your same organisation who are, you know, looking after street amenity, who are looking after safety, who are looking after business interests, people who work in parks, people work in libraries, and every one of those people are having a touch point into homelessness as well. And so uh, while it's not necessarily in their job title or their job description, a lot of people uh, hold responsibility for homelessness. And uh, in, the, in the homelessness team, what we found was we had to work with many different parts of council and build many different relationships. And often our, you know, the outcomes that we were looking towards our KPIs were not the same. So mm. it was really a negotiation and a navigation and a learning situation where we, we had to reach out to many parts of the community and uh, understand how we were going to respond to the, to the situation that happened on our streets. And I remember in the summer of uh, 2016, because some of those images were going across Australia, really, mm. uh, if I think around, I think it's Flinders Street Station or, or, or Civic Square around, around that area in Melbourne. There are a lot of people protesting as well. There are a lot more rough sleepers, as you said. It must have been a very difficult time managing that team, as you said. 
Um, and I think also, I mean, without naming any particular uh, newspapers, there was obviously a bit of a campaign going to put a spotlight on that issue, um, which often can make these kind of uh, situations quite inflammatory or contentious. And people have strong views over the, over the responses that are needed. Um, what was the reason for the big influx of people coming into town? Was Because we see that in Northern Territory as well. We actually have mobility, high levels of mobility of, of visitors, sometimes people who are only in town for a little while before going back home and, and others who are looking for more longer-term accommodation. Was there a particular reason that you can recall as to why the situation built to a climax in 2016? I mean, I'm just thinking, was there any Commonwealth Games or anything on at the time that was the backdrop to that? Commonwealth Games were a bit earlier than that, and actually they yeah. set up a very good homelessness protocol during the Commonwealth Games that a lot of uh, organisations used for a long time. But you know, some a lot of people have asked that question, and um, what I've what I've heard mostly was that it was really just a perfect storm or an imperfect storm, really, just the combination of years of uh, of government policy that uh, you know, cut the amount of social and affordable housing in Victoria. I always found it quite uh, surprising that while Victoria is such a progressive um, state in so many ways, the public housing lists, waiting lists in Victoria are higher than most other parts of the country. Um, and there was, so there were, you know, there was very little public housing available. There'd also been government uh, strategies some 20 years even before that had changed the way that mental health was managed in the community. There was also that uh, sudden boom in uh, housing prices. So, you know, we saw housing prices and rental prices go up really quickly. And then, you know, places of, you know, some of these places of last resort, some really big old caravan parks and old hotels and rooming houses that weren't necessarily, they were never the best place for people to live, but they were somewhere to live. A number of them were sold in a short period of time and that really put uh, pressure on, um, on, on the places or reduced the number of places that people could, could go to. So it wasn't really one thing, it was just a combination of a whole lot of situations. And I actually found that in um, other cities that I visited while I was traveling that you know other places have, have experienced that too. So we're, we're not alone. The, the, the story all along here is that, you know, actually a lot of these issues are faced in many, many places. And in Melbourne, it played out, as you mentioned, really, um, really, really sort of strongly on the streets. Um, there were newspapers that were running um, that were running campaigns about cleaning up the city. Uh, Melbourne was at the time also had that title of the world's most livable city. So uh we, we often knew that from the council perspective, if there was a story that run, ran in the papers, it wasn't very long before we started getting calls and um, calls and also uh, letters in asking the city to do something about it and to clean yeah. up the problem. We'll come to the uh, tertiary fellowship very quickly. I'm uh, just curious about some of the some of the tertiary studies you've done. So obviously in business and communications and the like, but also in anthrop anthropology. So having that lens of anthropology and I guess working in government and non-government sectors, dealing with issues like homelessness and community development. Does anthropology bring a, a specific lens? I'm curious as to where that fits into the mix, whether that's something of interest to you or whether you see some um, good, good crossover between the field work of anthropology and also homelessness. Yeah, um, I think that, you know, it's a mix for me. I mean, I'm not a I'm not a great anthropologist who can uh, rattle off all the uh, theory for you, but what, from my perspective, um, my my with, with anthropology and also with communications and journalism, it's just that thing about you know my I think it's an interest in people and in observation and in understanding, asking questions, watching, learning, and just mm -hmm. thinking about what you know how different people you know sort of how how they would operate in their own spaces and how they would operate in locations. And I think that's a really interesting part of the story too, because sometimes homelessness also has to do with how, you know, the, the place that you're in, and uh, we might come to it later, Pete, but some of the work that I saw in libraries, for example, as places of connection, um, you know, we, we do have really different ways of uh, reacting to, uh, people react to places in different ways, and that really impacts the way that we can uh, respond to homelessness as well. But it's really just a thing about asking questions and really wanting to know why and looking at uh, human behavior. Mm. 
well, talking about why and 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 asking questions and having that curiosity, I think, which is a strong um, a, a strength that comes through from from a conversation already. Um, I, I guess um, I, you said also that in terms of the role of local government in homelessness that it wasn't well defined and that I guess piqued an interest in you in exploring a Churchill fellowship for those who might not be aware of what that involves and how did that how did that come about and and I guess what's involved in undertaking a church a Churchill fellowship in uh, in in I guess homelessness and specifically what local government can do to end homelessness Churchill fellowships are really great opportunities open to any Australian to participate in. And uh, the fellowships actually started up um, soon after uh, Winston Churchill's death in the 1960s. There was a, um, a door knock appeal actually around Australia and people contributed money towards a, um, an organisation that would create a legacy. And the idea being that it would be about helping ordinary Australians, so you don't have to be an academic or somebody who's, you know, sort of at the top of their field to apply for a Churchill Fellowship. But what you need to have is curiosity and you need to be able to articulate a problem and be keen to go and find those, those answers to those problems. And then you come back to Australia and you uh, share that with your communities, which is what I'm doing now. So um, the, the idea of doing that was really appealed to me because firstly, when the homelessness situation started happening in, in Melbourne, there really wasn't very many people to ask about um, what, to, what to do because uh, there, there's not, not many people talk about the role of local government in the homelessness response. There's a lot of, uh, lot of other players who have got, you know, have a, have a lot of writing and uh, experience but not, not, not local government. So some of the things I did, for example, was call up other local government areas. So I know you... Um, had Trish from homelessness uh, from homelessness New South Wales on um, on your show just recently, and you know um, Trina was someone who I was able to call up and ask. But there really weren't you know we could watch what people were doing in other parts, but there really weren't very many other opportunities. So put in an application and uh, yeah got through and and got the got the fellowship. So it's great, and I encourage anybody to to have a look at the. The Churchill uh, website and, and and have a look at it because it's a great opportunity. So you so that's fantastic. So you've gone over to the UK, Canada, and the US, if I understand correctly, those mm -hmm. three main areas. And you've you've met you've had over fifty interviews, I, I think, um, with a whole lot of people that you hadn't met before. Um, so they've obviously been pretty generous with their insights and with their time. And you've come back. I just. Um, Flash this thing uh, in front of the camera so people can see it. It's it's, uh, it's a it's a quite a significant report. Um, a lot of pages, a lot of uh, insights, a lot of case studies, and links to very practical examples of what um, councils and other organisations are doing right across those those regions. What were some of the highlights, uh, Leanne, from from that whole experience? Oh, it's always hard to to pick out a few, but. Um... I think in the UK, it was really interesting to learn about their work on prevention. So there was a lot of um, a lot of work done on on building prevention skills, and a lot of that came out of uh, uh, you know sort of government uh, decisions that cut uh, funding in the UK some years ago through austerity measures. So a lot of councils found suddenly that they had to, to lose a significant amount of their budget. And, you know, while that's a terrible thing to happen to local government, actually in some places it really uh, pushed some locations to really look at sort of what they could do and how they could, uh, you know, sort of play their role in different ways. So prevention is, is really interesting because, uh, you know, often in local government we're often, we're often the, the, the uh ambulance at the bottom of the cliff as opposed to looking at what we can do to, to stop the situation in the first place. And there is a role there. Mm -hmm. um, in the US, you know, the, the, the numbers of, you know, homelessness numbers are really significant, I suppose. And we do hear a lot about the homelessness situation in the US. But uh, what I would say is there are actually some really amazing programs coming out of that and initiatives uh, and, uh, you know, it's not to be, you know, there's a lot for us to learn. There's a lot of work in the US also in looking at mayors and the role that mayors can play in influencing the homelessness uh, 
the homeless story and the narrative about homelessness. There are also some really um, great pieces of work in, uh, you know, sort of going into community and doing sort of really, you know, close, taking close action with communities. So, yeah, lot to lot to see, lots of lots of things that were of interest. No one's no one's solved homelessness, mm. but um, there's a lot that we can do to get towards mm. that. Was there anything that surprised you? Um, I think that uh, this sometimes the scale of homelessness in some places did did surprise me in places like New York, even though that you even though you know that uh, that there, there is home, you know, that there is going to be large amounts of homelessness. But it also surprised me sort of what amazing programs they had to actually go out and, um, you know, work with people in really, you know, caring and uh, thoughtful ways. I got to spend a, an evening from midnight out on the trains in um, Co at Coney Island where uh, groups of, of, um, of uh, outreach workers and police and uh, train staff actually go and, um, you know, sort of intercept people who are coming in on, who are spending the nights on trains and try to get, encourage them to come and come into shelters. And just the, the way that people worked and the way that they did that. And also the great relationships, actually, the relationships between police and, and work and, and the um, outreach workers was really respectful and uh, not, not as heavy handed as I expected police in the United States would, would be as well. So, yeah, a few, few surprises along the way there. Just breaking a few stereotypes more than anything, I think. I, know, I think that is an interesting um, theme that comes through the reports. And also one of the libraries, I think it's in San Francisco, you refer to Nat Tenderloin City District there where the main library employs people with lived experience for a few hours each day. A terrific story, a little bit different. What, what, what's, what's just as an example, I guess, of things doing things, uh, organisations trying things differently or things that maybe we haven't tried elsewhere. That was That was quite an innovative approach, wasn't it? It really was, and the libraries are really very interesting, actually, as connection points. And I was interested in that to start off with because we had already connected in with um, with this uh, San Francisco library some years ago and started up a social work program in the city of Melbourne libraries, which was just a great experience. And uh, what was really interesting to see, though, when I actually got there was the work that uh, the, the social workers in, in, well, in San Francisco and also in, I saw in, library, in libraries in Baltimore where uh, lived experience workers are coming in and uh, working really closely um, with people coming into the, with patrons coming into the library. And, um, you know, the ability to connect in is, is quite, uh, you know, is quite significant, I suppose, when you're, you know, when you're somebody who knows this, the situation, who has lived the, the life and you can, you can connect in with people in different ways. But really interesting as well, places like Baltimore had really strong uh, training mechanisms linked to that as well. So they were really good job creation projects as well. And um, it just showed us, I mean, we do, I, I, we, we do work in, in councils, in the councils I've worked with, with people with a lived experience of homelessness. And often we, we work with people with a lived experience to help break down barriers and to help tell stories and help humanise homelessness. And that's a, that's a great outcome. But I also saw that it could go that, that bit further in job creation. And a lot of councils are interested in job creation activities. So why not look at, at those ways? Why not work on, you know, in your libraries to connect in with people who are homeless as well? Absolutely. Now, you mentioned it's difficult in local government land. And I've, I've worked with quite a few local governments over the years, and I've always enjoyed working um, with councils and, and, and aldermen and, and I guess uh, their staff as well, because they they do a lot more, obviously, than just uh, rates and rubbish and bins and those kind of things. So they operate often in tight uh, financial environments, as you point out, uh, often with rate uh, caps and, and, and the like. Uh, it's difficult for them to fund a lot of work uh, in terms of things like homelessness and, and assertive outreach because I guess they have competing uh, priorities and stuff. But you make the point that there is nevertheless a community expectation often that councils will do something about it. Um, and often 
I guess, um, individual ratepayers will go up to their councillors or aldermen and say, look, what are you doing about uh, all the rough sleepers we're seeing? So I guess if I was a new CEO of a, of a council and saying, look, why should I, why should my council do anything in, in homelessness? Because, you know, we've got so many other things to do. We don't have the, the resources or the finances like the state and federal government has. What would you say to me? Why, sh why should I be interested in, in doing something about homelessness for my local government area? I think the first thing I would do is put on my old communications hat and say perceptions are very important. And even though councils might not have the money or the mandate to respond to homelessness, often in the community's eyes, they are the ones who, who, who need to do something about it. And so when we, when we think about the role that, that local government can play, and I mean, we can go on and talk about, you know, the, the, the difficulties in, in money and with, with, with funding and, and things like that. But really, councils are in the best position to actually respond to homelessness. I mean, we know that we know our communities, we have many operations that are happening in many different parts, you know, on the streets when we're thinking about rough sleeping, but then in many other parts of the community as well where homelessness might be experienced. So, you know, it could be that, you know, many councils do think that, you know, there isn't a role to play, but, um, you know, if it's in your community and the community expects you to take action, then actually there is a reason to get involved. And I think that's where we actually start having to talk to the state and federal governments about um, what it could actually take to support councils to uh, respond to homelessness because the amount of money that it might actually take a council to, to do something, for example, one role, maybe $100,000 is a lot. It could be the biggest barrier that a council faces. It could, be the, it could be actually the difference between taking action or not taking action. But if you look at funding streams and, and opportunities, we know that there's a lot more money that state and federal governments have than they spend on homelessness. So why not look at local government and why not invest in the, in the area of government that's closest to the people? I was going to say, uh, Leanne, in terms of uh, you know, when we talk about place-based approaches to homelessness prevention and, and early intervention, um, I guess, is there a case for at least some funding to go to local councils instead of state and territory governments because they can deliver place-based solutions to, to rough sleeping in other homelessness? Uh, it's... You know, it, it, the reason I call my report everybody's business is because it is everybody's business. There's not one level of government that can can work on this, and there's not one um, organisation that can uh, find a find find a, a solution to homelessness. I mean, we know from here in Australia and from you know around the world that it takes many different organisations and many different uh, partners to come together to do something about that. But I think that, you know, local government has a role to play. Uh, you know, local government is very close to community and can um, and is in a good place to collaborate and organise and bring, you know, forge partnerships and bring many different stakeholders together. So there's that collaboration side of things. There's the strategy setting, and you mentioned that earlier, Pete, about, you know, sort of the role that you know, local government can play in sort of working with everybody to, to, to come up with a strategy, to come up with a joint purpose, to actually know what everybody's role can be. Um, local government is also in a position where it can assist with, you know, doing things like by name lists and helping, not actually doing the actual outreach work and the work of services, but helping services come together and collaborate on, on things like that too. So the role of local government isn't in service delivery, I don't think, um, though some do go into that space. I think that the local government's role is really in these, you know, in four areas about knowing your local homelessness situation, about being a, and, you know, getting the data and helping, helping partners collect the data that they need. It's about leading the narrative and driving the collaboration. So some of those, um, the points I made earlier about mayors and uh, telling the story about homelessness, being able to actually articulate what's needed to be done and, and also break down some of the misconceptions that, that, that arise as well. Um, and then also about, you know, councils are also able to organise approaches and workforces. So bring the right people into the room, bring the, you know, bring the right partners, 
get your staff involved so that you have the people who have touch points into the community trained and knowledgeable about homelessness so they can do something. And then finally, you know, where necessary, act and prevent homelessness. So, you know, there might be some councils that do go into housing and that's a that's legitimate based on the circumstances. But for others, that may never be actual actually possible. But we do know that councils can look after land land use and land planning and facilitate work on that side. And we also know that councils can work on prevention and making sure that people actually don't fall through the cracks in the first place by and, and actually get assistance before, you know, the issue is actually, you know, physical homelessness. Cool. And following on from that, you went to Manchester the, and there's a number of uh, councils as part of the greater Manchester mm -hmm. region. Uh, and they actually, I understand, had a, uh, a, an initiative called Making Homelessness Everyone's Business in Manchester. And I, I read that it struck you the high rates of homelessness in Manchester with some of the highest rates United Kingdom there, but how they were actually making some inroads, getting some movement on addressing homelessness. And part of it in terms of breaking down silos and working for the local community rather than an individual service. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's going on over in Manchester and uh, what they're doing over there that's good? Yeah, the thing that struck me the most about Manchester, especially the City Council, was that they actually handed over their homelessness response in many ways to their community. So they had a Manchester Homelessness Partnership and that's run by a whole lot of different organisations in Manchester with churches, with services, with police, a whole lot of different different groups. And if you actually went and looked, if you looked up, looked at the homelessness um, strategy for, for, for Manchester City, you wouldn't even know that it was the council's homelessness strategy. That strategy belongs to the whole community. And uh, what, the, what, what staff at Manchester told me as well was that by doing that, by handing over that homelessness strategy and, and, and just allowing people to actually do what they needed to do, Sometimes that also um, eliminates some of the, uh, you know, some of the, um, the, the the things that people could say about your council. So it could alleviate some of the criticism because then it is actually in the community's hand and it doesn't become the council's problem. It becomes the community's thing to work together on to find to find solutions together. So that was um, that that was really uh, interesting to me, and I thought that you know, sort of often as council workers, we don't like to give away what's ours. You know, we don't want to. Uh, you know, we want to have control over things, but sometimes we have to we have to let go. And uh, it was interesting too, actually, because after Manchester, I travelled up to Glasgow, and in Glasgow they have the they have an alliance to end homelessness, and in that location. The council has actually, the councils in, in, in the UK obviously have a little bit more, they have bigger budgets and a bit more um, responsibility because of the, the way that government's structured. But they actually, the, the council in Glasgow actually handed over its entire homelessness budget, about £25 million, to an alliance of, uh, of agencies who then spent it in the best way possible. And the council was just one, one participant in there amongst everybody else and had an equal, you know, with equal kind of voting rights and everything on what happened. So, um, you know, I just, just, I think that some of those examples about sort of power and distribution and participation are really, really important mm -hmm. things for us to learn from over here too. And I think one of the things you also said was, it's good for councils to, to do what they do very well, which is collaborate, work with local communities, a business, non-government organisations, churches, uh, citizens, bringing people together, but also it's important to know when to step back and let others lead. It's often the hardest part, Pete, isn't it? It often is, letting go. Lives. <laughs> letting go, it's always hard. Mm. I've got to ask you before we uh, fly out of Manchester and go across the Atlantic to the United States and Canada, um, what is this legislative theatre? That sounds like an incredibly uh, interesting concept. Again, it's sort of another way of handing out, you know, the the, the sort of the work, putting it out to the community. And in Manchester um, and in a, another location in London called Haringey, they had both done legislative theatre where basically they take, 
they they bring a group of people together. They're trained people in legislative theatre, so they 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 bring together a group of um, a cross section of people from the community, and they workshop. So people with lived experience, people who are working in the sector, council workers, community members, they workshop the experience of what uh, you know the homelessness experience and the experience of working with services, and um, and basically then build a piece of theatre based on that and um, on some of those issues. And then they'll perform that theatre with wider groups and they do it over time. And those groups, in those groups are people who hold budget and hold, who hold responsibility for um, you know, decision-making. And together they actually work out what the actual you know, needs are, what the challenges are, and uh, work out sort of what, what needs to happen in that community in a kind of different way. And, what I heard from um, the people in council that I spoke to who, who were part of it was that it really allowed them to see things from the perspective of others, not just from your own council perspective. So um, the, the, Greater Manchester, the Greater Manchester Authority actually used that process to build their own prevention strategy as well. Which is, which is quite amazing. As did Haringey Council on their homelessness rough sleeping plan. The uh, person I met in Haringey said that they had, you know, really taken, you know, every point that had come through a legislative theatre, they had actually integrated into the plan. But again, it's about having people who can turn around and actually give that over from, mm. you know, give the power over and actually listen. So you actually really do need a lot of commitment right from the top and all through an organisation to be able to do it. It's quite mm. a sophisticated uh, way of working, I think. Yeah, very powerful indeed. Uh, one of the things also in Leicester, you uh, noticed that they uh, struck a definition of homelessness, uh, including stated aims uh, and values. Um, can you discuss, I guess, the importance of actually having a definition of homelessness? Because it's hard to come by, isn't it? That's exactly right, Pete. And the, the thing is, is that if you know what you're all working towards, then you're more likely to be able to, 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 to get somewhere together. I mean, we know this outside of the homelessness space in, in many other parts of collaboration. Um, if, you know, you can go into a meeting and you can have 10 different people and every person can think of something really differently. And if you don't actually stop and define it, when you walk out of that meeting, everybody's heard it a little bit differently. Everybody's seen it from a slightly different perspective. So the in, in Leicester, the, the, the Together Leicester partnership had really worked hard to create that joint definition and, um, you know, to work towards it. So they everybody knew it was a definition and also principles. Everybody knew what they were working on. And I think that when you do bring collaboration into play and you do bring different groups of uh, different groups of part, different partners into it, you really do have to do that because often we are working at really different uh, purposes. It's, it's, it's an often not an easy partnership. It, it takes work and this really helps. Absolutely. And I think also just in terms of, of that notion of having a definition up here in the Northern Territory, we have people, as I mentioned before, coming to Darwin in search of permanent accommodation, um, permanent housing, whereas others come over for short periods of time, maybe for medical treatment or cultural reasons, some of whom may need housing as well, but others visiting Darwin and needing a place to stay, needing shelter. So even within those, what would appear to be, um, I guess, a big homelessness problem, often when you break it down, it can be uh, all different kind of people with different stories and, and, and contexts and cohorts, I guess, as well. So I guess there is power in that definition. Otherwise, you're looking to try and solve a problem with visitors or maybe some visitors who might be engaged in antisocial behaviour if they're coming here to, to um, I guess, let their hair down, shall we say, for a weekend or two, is a very different policy approach and an approach on the ground, isn't it, than, uh, than, I guess, looking at what do we need to do to address people who are sleeping rough or people who are couch surfing um, or in temporary accommodation needing some more permanent housing. So... Definitions matter, don't they, in terms of getting the right focus in the right areas? I, I absolutely agree, Pete. And the thing is, is that in Australia, while we have a, we, we do use a regularly agreed definition of homelessness based on the census, um, how the census data is pulled together, 
um, we don't have a, you know, we don't have a national definition um, and that, you know, that could be really helpful as well. Sure. I'd just like to um, go to a slightly different tack at the moment in terms of the pressures that are on local government to deal with, I guess, let's talk about street homelessness from the sense of, uh, I guess, the assertive outreach or providing support um, for helping rough sleepers get the assistance they need, whether that be accommodation or whether it be connected connection to other services versus the other pressures that obviously come on to council around moving people on or tidying up the streets uh, and the issues that the business might have or concerns around amenity and, and access and safety and those things. You talk about that quite a bit in your report as well. And, and, and something you said that also stood out, I think, was that often councils have to resort to the notion of enforcement because there aren't clear alternatives and that. So up in, in the Northern Territory, we have some councils that are doing assertive outreach, uh, which is very positive in terms of having that really, um, uh, I guess, constructive conversation with people sleeping rough. Um, they often fly under the radar, but they do very important work. But also, and, and very recently up here, we've seen a lot of um, public commentary on the need for, or the pressures on council to find rough sleepers or to move them, move them on. Mm -hmm. So there are these competing, I guess, competing uh, conflicts on, on councils. Uh, and you went to San Francisco and you saw their health, uh, San Francisco's Health Streets Operations Centre. And I, th I think that was a more holistic approach to dealing with some of these challenges. Can you comment on, on that and any other observations you might have around how councils juggle that enforcement expectation along with so doing something more, shall we say, constructive in terms of addressing the problems? Mm -hmm. That's often the biggest, um, the biggest issue that councils face are those conflicting uh, responses and conflicting uh, responsibilities in the in the community, and that was actually the question that I initially posed when I applied for the Churchill Fellowship, because I certainly saw that close up when I was at the City of Melbourne, and um, I've seen that since as well. Uh, the thing is, is the reality is, is that we all need to work together, and but the. But, but what happens in practice often is that we find that we can find it quite hard, particularly when we're working on different, uh, you know, we have different di different outcomes and, and different requirements and different ways of getting into to do things together. But I think the places where they've uh, been most successful, I think, in, in sort of navigating this is where different groups have come together and worked, uh, you know, in a, in, in a collaborative way. Also acknowledging that not everybody has to see eye to eye but actually understanding that, you know, we that working together is the most important thing. Um, the Health Streets Operations Centre in San Francisco was really interesting. I actually sat in the office while the, the, the um, my colleague who was uh, doing the work while he was in one of the meetings. So I actually just listened to them uh, running their meetings as well. It was mainly just because he had to do that meeting before we could have our meeting. But it was interesting to listen because they run it like an emergency. So... Um, and we saw a bit of that during COVID as well, how, you know, sort of you can, you can run, you know, when, when, when homelessness becomes a, a, a public health issue and an emergency issue, you get a really different kind of uh, response and, and outcome. But uh, what, they, what they did there was the, the mayor of, uh, a former mayor of San Francisco just found that, you know, he was always seeing different groups, of, you know, different parts of the, of, of the government sort of working on homelessness and not necessarily talking to each other and, you know, having, coming into it with really cross purposes. So he brought this group together and it included groups like um, the Homelessness Services um, arm of the San Francisco government, but also emergency services, uh, the um, people are responsible for amenity, brought in police, brought in, you know, a whole lot of different sort of unlike, often unlikely partners as well to come together and um, was really sort of one of these sort of situations where you uh, go location by location and actually work out how you're going to collaborate to, you know, for your outcomes. And again, it's really important in these situations, like we were talking about before, about having a definition, knowing what you're working towards so that you're all, you're all doing that together. And, and we've seen that happen in Australia as well. Like this wasn't, you know, in, in places, like I know at the city of Melbourne and now at Brimbank where I work as well, hotspots groups are doing, are doing that work as well, sort of bringing these parts of, 
how different parts of council, services, police, health, you know, emergency services together to, to respond. And I think unless you can actually work all that out together, you know, then if you don't, if you can't do that together, what often happens is councils often feel powerless as far as homelessness come, goes. And often council res will resort to the only tool in their toolbox, which is enforcement, because that is the one place that councils can actually do something. So if you, you know, if you leave it and you don't bring all your partners in, you might go down that, go down that path of enforcement only when in fact what we know is that we can have you know sort of we can talk about this we can work collaboratively we can have a social welfare and social justice focus when we're looking at the cleanliness of our streets at the amenity at um, movement you know it doesn't have to be either or it can be and and I think councils will be well placed to because of the connections to the coalface, so to speak, with their with their local government areas, with communities, with people on the ground. Uh, they'd be well placed also to shape the conversation around rough sleeping and homelessness too, uh, because there are a lot of myths, aren't there? Um, and there's a lot of um, I guess there's probably an opportunity for a, a more information education around the backstories that people have who are experiencing homelessness to maybe help shift public sentiment. And that's where I think also the power of mayors come in as well. So the elected officials in councils and particularly mayors, I mean, mayors often don't have a lot of money to, to, to throw around, but they do have a microphone and they do, they can actually influence how the community stands on issues and what the community does. So I had a, had an opportunity to um, talk a little bit to, to talk to a few people about you know what mayors can do. So for example, that former mayor in um, in in San Francisco who brought that group together. Uh, when I was in New York, um, the the New York mayor actually has initiated a weekly meeting between all the most senior people who uh, work in homelessness and, and, and associated areas. And um, either the mayor or the deputy mayor will ask the questions every week about what they're doing. And uh, uh, the, the head of uh, New, York's, New York's homelessness administrator, Jocelyn Carter, said, you know, one thing she said to me was that, you know, he brings everybody to the table and he tells everyone they have to play, you know, play well in the playpen. And, um, you know, that's that's that accountability that's that's really important as as well. Um, and, you know, there's there's also mayors in, uh, in in Canada as well that I saw, you know, are having really strong voices and really, uh, really sort of uh, getting out there and, and, and bringing people along. Of course, it can go the other way as well. So if a mayor looks at enforcement and sort of, you know, moving moving uh, people who are experiencing homelessness out, that could be the way that a, that, that a city or, or location can go as well. Absolutely. Now, Leanne, you're, you're back, uh, back in Australia now. Obviously, you must be uh, delighted to have um, finished this report and putting it all together. Um, in terms of the way it's formatted, I... You know, it's got a lot of it's a, it's got a uh, it's got a structure around those four key areas that um, that government can local governments can consider or workers in the local government sector can consider. I guess um, looking through, I'm just rapidly racing through my notes to find this here now. It's the structure you use is called No Lead, Organise and Act. In terms of what councils should do, so there's a lot of um, a lot of recommendations there. There's a lot of observations and insights as well as some, um, I guess it's a bit of a toolkit really for local government to learn as to what, what they can do. Um, and I, it also, it's interesting to me that it, it focuses on reminding people of the important work that they're doing rather than just the urgent and how often, uh, I guess, people in local government are so busy doing lots of stuff, they maybe sometimes forget to communicate all the important work that they are doing around collaboration and bringing people together and having those conversations. So. Just in terms of people from local government who might be watching on, how how would you like to see people from um, local government potentially engage with this uh, with this report that you've done? How might they find it useful? What can they do with it? Well, I'm I'm really hoping that uh, this is not this is not the sort of document that you might read from beginning to end. Though I think it sounds like you might have read it, Pete. So uh, thank you for that. 
Um, but the idea is, is that it's a bit of a flip document. So, you know, you can go in there, you can have a, you know, have a little look through. There are 17 um, actions that local government can take. You might decide that, you know, one or two or three or four of them are relevant to, to your situation. And I just structured it in a way so that, you know, Want to be positive about it i don't want to be there are a lot of negatives in, in in homelessness but and working in this space it's a really hard space to work in and i i know that from my own experience as well as talking to people but the idea here is to you know sort of understand what you, what you might be able to do get some ideas from some other people who have done it i've put in lots of uh, resources so you can go in and do your own sort of research and find out your own things and just, you know, sort of just learn and do and, you know, not everything works every time, but, you know, sometimes you just need to get in there and give it a try and then um, adapt, as, adapt as you go. So hopefully it's just a really useful toolkit that, that local government workers can pick up and, and have a go. And it's not only local government workers, I think it's really important as well for people working in other parts of um, government and also in, in other, you know, in the welfare sectors, just to also understand, you know, what local government can do for you, because there is a lot that local government can do. And um, often we're, you know, really overlooked. Later this year, there'll be a national housing and homelessness plan uh, put together following consultations that um, Minister Julie Collins is, is, is going, her department will be overseeing, I guess, coming up in the next few months. Just in, um, I guess, in terms of uh, a final remarks, Leanne, if, uh, if Minister Collins was listening and, and hearing that local government is interested in engaging in a conversation around a national housing and homelessness plan uh, and thinking, well, why should I have local government at the table? In summary, and having regard to what you've seen uh, as part of this uh, fellowship, uh, Churchill Fellowship Program that you've done, what would you say? Well, first of all, local government needs a seat at the table. And I know that we've already, uh, you know, uh, reports like the Productivity Commission and other reports have already recognised that, that local government has a role to play in here. And that uh, really, you know, local government holds the holds the local situation and really has an opportunity to, to know, has a level of knowledge and, a, and an ability to interact with community in a way that other parts of, of, other parts of government uh, may struggle to do so. So bringing local government to the table actually could make a really big, really big difference. But what we need to do is we actually need to fund them because without the money to be able to, to take this action, often local government will, will stick to the side or maybe make uh, decisions that aren't really the, the, the best for the community. So um, I really just think that it's important to make sure that local government's part of what that, that national plan is and also just think about how they can be in that, how different local governments, and there are more than 500 in Australia with all different situations, can actually, uh, you know, get in there and, and, and actually do something about it. Fantastic. And what's next for you now with this, Leanne? So you've you've done the uh, you've, you've done the report. Um, it's hot off the press, as I said at the start. Um, what's the next steps in terms of either engaging with people across Australia as as part of the learnings and lessons from it? How what are you looking for from here? And I guess what's expected under the program for you to to wrap up this work. So the expectation from the Churchill Trust is for me to do things like this, to go out and talk about what I've learned and start the conversation. And I'm really looking forward to, to doing that, to talking to as many you know, people in, in local government and in other levels of government as I can to just build some understanding around this, this, this sort of untapped area because there really hasn't been very much at all about what local government can do, this, um, as, I, as I mentioned before. So... I just want to get out there and talk to as many people as I can, uh, hear about what, you know, what, what, what's working and what's not working. And I'd really love to create a community of um, like-minded practitioners who might uh, share and uh, grow together. So it's a, 
it's early stages. This is the first step in, um, you know, starting the conversation. And I just hope that we're really able to continue. And there are groups like the Australian Local Government Association and the Council of Capital City Lord Mayors who are helping um, move this conversation along. So through them, I'm hoping to be able to uh, get out there and, and, and sort of share what I've learned because I think we've got a lot to do. Yeah, thanks, Leanne, and I'm sure we'll see you on a conference program coming to a city near you uh, this year and next year, perhaps, with a hurry coming up in October. Let's hope we get to see you there, Leanne. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure having you share the couch with us today. Thanks, Pete. It's lovely to have been here with you. You've been listening to or watching uh, Leanne Mitchell. Leanne is the Manager of Community Strengthening and Social uh, Planning with Brimbank Council in Victoria, talking about the work that she's been doing in local government world, as well as the Churchill Fellowship that she's just come back. And I really would recommend, um, if you can, um, download a copy of this report. It's a, it's got, I didn't talk to Leanne about this, but it's got an absolutely uh, beautiful piece of artwork on the, on the front. So that in itself is enough to, uh, to, I guess, want you to open up and read it. it. certainly was the case with me. It's very accessible and readable. There are lots of links and lots of little areas where you can uh, get your smartphone out and hit the scanner and download more detail if that's what you're interested in. So I really would recommend uh, people who have enjoyed this podcast to go, go online, download a copy and follow the links. And as Leanne said, it very much is a document that you don't have to read from cover to cover. It's, it's really is practical and filled with lots of really valuable insights. So do yourself a favour and check it out. We'll also, if Annie can, uh, can do this, I'm sure she can, we'll put a link to the uh, report at the end of this podcast so you can follow the links that go from there. But uh, thank you, everybody, for watching and listening in. Um, please be sure to hit that subscribe button and like the podcast if you want to uh, hear more of them. Make sure you don't miss out. And until next time, bye for now. Mm -hmm.